Uh, we're Ben and Luca from uh, Booking.com. Uh, we work in the scaling machine learning team. Uh, our mission is to scale machine learning uh, by uh, developing tools so people can uh, rapidly deploy and develop models. Uh, we mostly focus on feature engineering uh, and uh, scaling uh, with modeling uh, using H2O. And um, I guess some of you know Booking.com. Who has used it maybe once to book a hotel or bed and breakfast? Okay, that's good. Okay. Yeah, I think the US were smaller than uh, other companies. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, good to hear. Um, so Booking.com is pretty old. Uh, it's already uh, 20 years old. Uh, they started in 1996. Back then, the website also looked like it was from 1996, and people were manually uh, creating bookings. Uh, it was completely different from what we do now. Now we have around uh, 20,000 people uh, throughout the world, 2,000 tech people in Amsterdam uh, working in various buildings. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, account managers and customer service agents working uh, throughout the world uh, to make uh, the travel experience smooth. And from 1996, we are using Perl. So still today, that is the main uh, uh, language we use. Uh, and our team, we are not using Perl. Uh, we are trying out new technologies uh, because we, we are here to scale. So uh, Kafka, uh, Spark, uh, H2O. Uh, Cassandra, those tools we try to integrate and make it a, yeah, a good experience for data scientists. So it's a bit of background. Um, our team really likes this quote. We, we don't have better algorithms than anyone else. We just have uh, quite some data. So we sell around 1.5 million room nights uh, per, uh, per day. So if you do some extrapolations about how many users that, that are and how many events these users generate, um, and if you train, train models and you use historical data, you might want to go one year back or even two years. That's a lot of data. Uh, so it's quite, quite a challenge to, to uh, optimize this. And if you have 200 data scientists uh, that all are doing similar things and maybe repeat each other's work, uh, and you have limited resources, we have our own uh, yarn set up, then uh, yeah, it's quite of a challenge to make sure this uh, skills uh, well. Uh, so yeah, we try to optimize those processes. Uh, we also think that it's with a lot of data, you, you can build decent models with really simple algorithms, logistic regressions, random forest, uh, GBM. With H2O, it's really simple to, to build these, uh, these models um, if you provided decent features, and uh, uh, then you can produce some de decent stuff quite easily. Um, so we don't, we don't really go for the really sophisticated approaches. Many times just try out uh, basic features, uh, simple models, and uh, our goal is to speed it up so we can really run fast experimentation. Um, an example that is not that simple or straightforward was uh, one of the bigger topics we work on, like machine translations. Uh, we have over a million partners, and each of them have um, uh, hotel descriptions, and we want to translate these into 43 languages. Um, because every, yeah, different people throughout the world uh, want to read it in their native language. And we mostly used uh, uh, Google Translate, but then we decided to try out um, our own descriptions because we've been building up a database for over 10, uh, 15 years. Um, so we tried it out ourselves, and then we, it turns out that we were actually much better than the, the general Google Translate for our use case. Um, yeah, because we have a lot of data for this specific purpose. So that was a nice example where it works. Um, some of the toolings that uh, the data scientists uh, use um, depends a bit on, on what kind of taste and preference they, they have. So uh, people use uh, local uh, machines, their laptops, to, to train models, or bigger servers that have, say, 100 gigs of RAM, 24 cores. And the past two years, we've been mo moving more, more towards uh, distributed ML. So Spark and H2O are used for the, the bigger uh, models. And TensorFlow, Rabbit, Scikit-Learn, yeah, people can, can choose whatever they, uh, they like. Um, but for us, it's now very easy to deploy models with uh, H2O. It's, uh, we quite like. So the, the bigger topics that, that require really uh, machine learning at scale, yeah, you can guess them, I think, if you uh, try to position yourselves in, uh, in us. Web marketing. Uh, so we are a, quite a good customer for Google. So we pay a lot on, uh, we, we bid a lot on uh, keywords. So every day we, we try to uh, uh, recalculate what these bids should be, how, they, uh, yeah, how much we want to spend. So that's a really big thing. Uh, recommendations. Uh, every time we use search, we, we need to predict uh, which hotels are the most relevant for you. So uh, let's say uh, Rome, you have 10,000 of hotels. It's quite uh, expensive to do this for many concurrent users. 
Uh, so that we also need to, to scale operations like that. And email marketing, who, who receives emails from uh, booking? Oh, that's not as much as a, like, like one a week or two or seven or 20? Many. <laughs> two, okay. Um, yeah, we hear that sometimes it might be a bit much. Uh, but that's also uh, one of the topics that, that requires quite some data uh, to, to do. So um, we formulated some requirements for ML. It doesn't sound that, that hard uh, or that complicated to some of this list. It should scale well, it should be easy to use, uh, statistically sound, fast, reliable, and easily productionizable. Especially the last one, is, uh, uh, I relate to that one quite, quite well because uh, when I first started, uh, I created the model with R, and it took quite some time to, to, uh, you know, to come up with that, and then I wanted to go to production, and then you have to translate it into Perl, and MySQL, and cron jobs, and I wasn't comfortable with any of this. Uh, so I had to work with all kinds of developers, it took a lot of time, and a lot of errors occurred, and, and yeah, these kinds of examples we really don't want uh, anymore, so the, it should be easy, as easy as possible. Data scientists should go to production as soon as possible. So the first thing we tried was uh, Spark, MLlib, two years ago. Uh, Spark is really awesome at, at data munching. Uh, yeah, we still use it the f uh, for that main, uh, main purpose. And we also assumed that uh, Spark would also shine with the ML components. That wasn't really the case. It was uh, uh, quite unstable. It was also quite slow. Um, not many functionalities for the people that were using Python. And also quite hard to productionize. And the predictions were, were also not that fast. So we, we continued to search for something better. Then we met uh, H2O guys at Strata, um, and we tried it out. It was really uh, fast, super easy to use, the skills really good. Um, the mojos, or the pojos back then were, were really awesome. So that was, were good sales for us, so we, we continued working with that. But as soon as we tried to use it with more people at once, uh, during peak hours uh, during the week, uh, we, we couldn't really rely on, on uh, uh, stable sessions. So we use Yarn. Uh, who's familiar with Yarn? And, uh, okay, so basically we have limited resources. We have thousands of machines with a lot of cores, but we also have a lot of people that use a lot of cores at the same time. So you need to di distinguish or uh, uh, balance who gets what. Um, and Yarn also takes away resources when someone else might need it. And that's when an HO breaks. So uh, we uh, couldn't get that to work. So we teamed up with uh, uh, Kuba, Michal, uh, we developed the external cluster mode. Uh, Kuba, you're sitting there, I think. Let's raise your hand and <laughs> thank you for helping us out. It was really uh, awesome stuff that you built. And uh, Luca will explain that a bit more, what we did. Yeah. So actually, let's deep um, look a bit more why we like sparkling water booking. Um, so as we said, for us, this represents kind of uh, taking the best of two worlds. We really like the data matching ability and possibility with Spark to have this distributing computation so that we can create data frames with the meaningful feature that we want to use for training. But we didn't really like the algorithms from Spark ML. And instead, we quite like what H2O provides us. And the integration between these two pieces of software is quite smooth now. And that is really something that can boost our workflows and help us out to develop better models. Uh, so let's see how this usually looks like. Um, so as you can see on the left, we have data sources. Sources. So on our front end, we recall and we collect a lot of information about what our user look. So what kind of searches do you do on the website? What kind of hotels they look at? What kind of reviews they read? Um, and all of this data is saved into a separate pipeline that we have for events and eventually end up into our data warehousing system. We have then workflows on top that clean up this data and generates meaningful tables that people can use for training of models. So the typical workflow now is that people will start doing the data matching with Spark. They will come up with a data frame with all the features that are required. And then they can ship over to H2O and continue over there, um, doing the model building, choosing across different algorithms. It's also very convenient because Alpha Spark, per se, it's written in Scala and H2O in Java. They both provide uh, nice wrappers in R and Python, which are usually the languages that data scientists know and prefer to work with. So that's pretty convenient. And then once that you actually have your model, it's pretty easy to export it into this module format, for example, which is just binary code that you can easily embed into other services. And it allows quick predictions. So to complete a bit on what we saw in the previous image, what we do now is like we have exported the graph. Yeah. 
we are exported the, the model over here into a binary, and we want to deploy it in production. We'll go through how we actually deploy the models later on in the talk. Uh, but now what is also important is that on the front end, so on all of these pages that I was mentioning before, we are also collecting small streams of relevant information that we can reuse then with technologies like Spark Streaming to recompute the very same features that we use offline, online. And with that, we can feed the model and do in prediction real time during the session. So we means, that means that we can personalize the experience of the user visiting the website just real time in the same session, which is key. So about our collaboration with H2O, when we started one year ago, roughly, one year, one year and a half ago, um, what we saw is that H2O come with this mode, which is called the internal backend, um, where the backend here, it just means where is the H2O cluster sitting. And in this mode, what you see is that every Spark executor will spin up its own JVM, of course, and inside of that will spin up an H2O uh, node. And all these nodes then compose the cluster. This is good in the sense that uh, it's really easy to set up. It's quick to move data between the Spark context and the H2O context, because you don't really have to move anything. Uh, but at the same time, it was what Ben was mentioning before as a problem. If the number of workers in Spark change for any reason, decrease or increase, the H2O cloud fails and just, yeah, it explodes. <laughs> so that's not really useful for our use case, given that we have a very busy cluster where there are things enabled like preemption, which means that if resources are not available anymore, some of your workers may just get killed, and then you lose all of your session. Um, so together with H2O, we move to this model instead, which is the external backend. And the change here is that the workers and the cloud of H2O is completely separated. It's not with the Spark workers. So in our setup, for example, we created a dedicated queue in Yard, a queue which is not preemptible and with static resources. So people can start doing the data munching in their personal queue or team queue, and the H2O cluster lives in this separate queue. This has, has a drawback that now we need to ship data between the two contexts, but it allows to actually use this thing at scale for us, which was key. And if you want to dig a bit more into sparkling water, I know Kuba has a session today at one and on, so feel free to join it. All right. So how to integrate all of this and, and lift off this entire pipeline. We uh, uh, have all these components, uh, they're, they're scattered a bit. For people, it's new, so to provide a unified experience, that's uh, quite of a challenge. Uh, and again, the goal here would be to facilitate people going from ID, uh, from whiteboard to experiment, ideally within a day. So um, this is what we uh, uh, try to push as a team. Uh, on the top side, we have, um, yeah. We have model training offline, so this is all what is the comfort zone of data scientists when they can play around, they can screw up, they can just uh, try out all different things and, and make, it, make it work offline. There we have uh, data sources that mostly are raw events and then refined into more uh, structured uh, schemas. Spark to do a lot of uh, processing, and we have a custom project uh, called Feature Vader um, to do all the, the munching and to reconstruct historical training data. And that's a really big thing because, yeah, if you go back in time for two years, there's a lot of data to, uh, to recompute. And so that's a big thing. Uh, for online, to create the equivalent of the features that we produce offline, we have feature mappers, which is basically Kafka, Spark Streaming, and Cassandra, to update, uh, for example, counters in, in real time. Um, and then the model that people produce offline is uh, serving uh, requests in real time. And there's a feature store where people can, can look at uh, for inspiration. Uh, so they can search for a hotel ID and they can find all the features that are uh, providing information on it, or uh, the user ID to provide all kinds of user features. So uh, that's how we, we try to, uh, uh, to make it uh, accessible. So Feature Vader is a project that I've been heavily involved with and uh, uh, yeah, quite, quite uh, Fun enough, um, like I said, we have billions of, of events, uh, mostly unstructured JSON, which is, uh, is massive to process. Um, that needs to be uh, uh, done first. Uh, for feature engineering, uh, most of the stuff that we do is to count. So counters are really interesting. You also saw Mr. Tipshirani when he was discussing the features, most of them were counters. Um, so you can produce absolute counters, like how many bookings a certain email produced from now until uh, the beginning of time, 
or windowed features like how many searches the past uh, two weeks. Um, that sounds easy, but if you have uh, m millions of users, uh, if you have uh, SKU, for example, bots that target our site, then suddenly you have a lot of uh, events for, for one uh, dimension value. Uh, to produce code that takes all of these things into consideration, that's, that's uh, a bit of a challenge. Then the next step is to uh, do time coordinate matching. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is to leak information from the future into the past. Uh, so their model looks awesome offline, they sell it to everyone, it goes to production, <laughs> it kind of uh, drops to the, to the ice. That's uh, a big thing we, we try to fight. Uh, and it needs to scale. So those are the things we, uh, we look at for, for feature Vader. Um, how does it look like code-wise? Um, we uh, ask the users, the data scientists, uh, to provide instances. That's the term that Google uses for uh, when you have uh, a point in time and, uh, say, a user um, ID, uh, so the, the observation, um, and labels. So that's what people start with. Um, then they initiate a feature vader object. They point to the column that contains a timestamp. They give it an array with all the features they would like that they found in the feature store. And then they transform. And this might take, uh, say, 20 minutes to five hours, depending on how heavy the, the data is and how many people did this before them already. So if, if it's cached, then it's uh, much faster. If it's completely new and three years of data need to be processed, yeah, it's a bit heavier. Um, so they have a data frame here on the left that gets transformed into additional columns. Um, so that's uh, what, what we find quite useful. Luca? Yep. So we've seen now how we build or reconstruct features offline at certain instances of time, how do we translate then the very same feature online? So here the requirements are a bit different because as I said, we want to do prediction inside of the session that the user is visiting on the front end. So it means that we have as a requirements that we want a system which is nearly real time in processing. So we process this data and we want to emit the corresponding features and it should be in the order of seconds. As well as once that we have dumped this data somewhere so that they can reuse in all the different following pages, we want to be able to cache back the features really quickly uh, in the order of milliseconds. Ideally. And which kind of features we need to support, as Ben said, we both have features that are a bit more simple, so maybe you just want to filter out of some messages, but you may also want to do something that is a bit more involved, like computing counters over a certain window of time. And in that case, you kind of need to keep a state of what you are doing, so that, for example, if you process messages every 20 seconds, but you want to compute an aggregation over 10 minutes, then you need to keep a state of what you're doing. Otherwise, you're not able to do discounts. So that's how the product looks like. Um, what we have here, we call it feature mappers. Um, people get a template of uh, an application which is running with Spark streaming. Um, and the idea is that this application, once generated, is automatically able to read any kind of topic, that, any kind of stream that we uh, feed in our front end. So, for example, we may have a stream for search, a stream for hotel page views that have be, been seen by the different users. And then they can apply their own custom logic over here. So out of all these messages, they can apply filters, they can apply maps, counts, aggregations. And once we're happy with the result, they can dump it into a persistent storage so that it can be retrieved later on on the front end. And this persistent storage for us is Cassandra, which is a, a masterless and distributed um, database. It works really well over for this specific scenario because it's optimized for writing a lot. So we can write a lot of different features with different also dimensions. And if you are keen and do properly, you do properly the data modeling, it's also very fast in retrieving back these features. So you can actually get to the performance that we want, which is milliseconds to retrieve a single feature. That's all for the feature mappers. Next step. Okay, we have offline features, we have online features. How do people even understand, since we have 200 data scientists, what is available, who is owning what? And for that, we try to solve it with this feature store or feature portal. Uh, it's just a web application which collects a lot of metadata on all the available features. So it can tell you and it can allow you to discover which features are available, which ones are available offline, online, or maybe both, as well as the quality. So we record on our front end when we do prediction again for a certain model using certain feature, we record all the distribution of the values. And it's very good also for establishing the quality of the features. Um, ideally, this portal should help reusing features because our main goal as a team is indeed to make people being able to experiment faster. So if you don't always have to implement the same features and I can use the one from Ben, very good. 
Um, and at the same time, we want to push for ownership of features. So what we see a lot of times is, is that features are just implemented by a person and just kind of forgot, and no one picks it up. And when someone else wants to try to reuse them, and it's not sure how good is the quality. So by enforcing ownership, we can actually solve also this problem. Next, we have seen all about how we do feature engineering and reconstruction and sharing was. Let's now dig a, a bit into how we serve models in booking on our online um, web pages and for any kind of prediction. So H2 is really nice in here, as I was saying before, because it allows you to generate this uh, mojo, so this kind of compile classes that you can just use immediately for doing scoring. And we usually deploy models in two ways in booking. The first one is that we have, oh, okay, the animations are gone. I'll do it with the pointer. Anyway, so we have a dedicated model service, uh, which basically means that people can upload models somewhere to a central service, and then they can call it from anywhere on the front end with some parameters and all the list of the input values, all the features input values, and they get back a prediction. So how it works usually is like, person has already trained the model and saved it somewhere in HDFS. Uh, it can go to this model portal and trigger an upload of a new version of the model. Uh, the service automatically follows and picks this model and puts it in all the boxes that are available and makes it well known that this model now is available. So people now can start to call the model from production with the name of the model, a set of features, or the set of features that are necessary to make a prediction, and they will get back the result. This kind of uh, structure is very nice because it's easy to implement over here monitoring. And uh, if you instrument both the clients and the server over here, you may get nice graph like on the distribution of all the features that are involved, as well as for the model, which kind of output does it usually gives out. So you can compare also this distribution across model version. And again, it's really good to understand and debugging model and ensure that the quality remains high. And the next step is like, we have some other services in our front end. Uh, for example, the service for availability, which is a critical service for booking in the sense that we need low latency and really high throughput. The service for availability is what you use when you do a search in booking. For example, and you say, I want to find an hotel in Rome. Uh, this service is triggered and it receives your check-in and your, your check-out date and it returns all the hotels that are open and bookable and have rooms. So if you're Taking again something like Rome, it means that you may have something like 10,000 hotels that you need to retrieve. And if you want to apply prediction on each one of these hotels, it means that you need to do 10,000 predictions in a very small, in a page view. So 30, 40 milliseconds roughly. So it means that you need to do prediction in the order of dozens of microseconds. So it's really challenging. So in some use cases, it's not convenient, like in this one, to just call back uh, the model service because you pay the network traffic and all the bunch of prediction that you want to do. And instead what we do here is, no, yes. <laughs> what we do here, yeah, we skip it. Uh, no, we uh, created a, a fill layer API that is able to automatically load on all the different workers of this service um, a certain model. So we embed the model inside of the service directly so that when a new incoming search request arrives, uh, the load of all the hotels that needs to be evaluated is spread across all the different workers, and every single worker has the model local, locally, and he can do all the prediction and return back all the results. And this proved to work very well for us. Uh, we have experiments that are running in production with this system, and we didn't notice any increase in performance, sorry, in the time that the page takes before getting served back to the user. So it means that basically we're able to do a prediction in dozens of microseconds, which is remarkable for us. So that said, I think this is what all we wanted to share with you today. Yeah. Ben, so, wrap it up. Uh, to summarize, we gave some examples of how we use machine learning, the machine translations uh, topic, web marketing, uh, ranking hotels, and uh, email marketing. Um, that it's quite challenging to find something that's easy to use for data scientists and to deploy it automatically or autonomously in production uh, without de relying on developers. <laughs> Um, so with H2O and Sparkling Water, we have a good fit for that and uh, Spark feature map, streaming feature mappers. Uh, Antonio is one of the colleagues here that gives trainings on H2O, how we use it. Um, so that's working uh, quite well for us. Um, yeah, we show deployment modes. Uh, 
think that that's kind of it. So if you are interested in, uh, in learning more about this, we are very interested to share stuff. If you, for example, also work on, on projects like recreating training data, I'm very interested to, to uh, share experiences and maybe work together on, on code. Uh, if you're interested to work at Booking, there's a website, working at booking.com. We're growing like most of the companies here that talk. Uh, so always interested. It's in Amsterdam. I think it's uh, quite an awesome city to work in. Uh, better than Mountain View, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, feel free to approach us. Thanks for your time, enjoy your Thank day, you. and enjoy your lunch. Great. Thank you. Dan, Luca, great job. Appreciate it. Um, do we have any questions? I think we do have a few questions for you guys before we let you go here. Let's okay. kind of start with the first one. What advice do you have for companies who are new to machine learning? What should we care about? Which one of you want to take that? Uh, <laughs> try simple things first. Um, so many of the things we do is first the rule-based uh, approaches, uh, super simple things okay. to get a sense of uh, whether it works. Uh, if you see that there's an effect there, then maybe try more sophisticated uh, approaches, but don't stare blind on the machine learning, uh, or people associate machine learning mostly with making really complex modeling uh, steps and grid searches. And uh, Our experience is that quite simple models work quite well. Uh, easily, so uh, it's not that hard. It shouldn't be made that big of a deal, I think. Just get your feet wet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, the next question is uh, how many features do you have approximately? That's a well, it's a fun one. question because if you, some, some companies, they, they mention they have 10,000 features, or, or, but then if you zoom in, then they use Windows. Uh, so if you use an hourly version, a two hourly version, a daily version, then suddenly you have 25 versions of one feature and it can scale quite well. Um, so, yeah, I, don't, I would say uh, say 500 to 1,000 that are, are qu quite uh, uh, interesting. Uh, but if you add all these windows, then it becomes much bigger. Okay, great. When it comes to machine learning, how do you decide what's a great project to use it for? Um, mm -hmm. On which side? More on the ML building parts or on the feature engineering? Can or the business value. I think business value here. Yeah. Okay. That we share the roles a bit in teams. So you have product owners uh, that are officially uh, responsible for uh, the commercial value of, of a team. Um, so they kind of push uh, the, what kind of questions and problems we have. And then the, the developers and data scientists, they come up with answers. And that could be machine learning. It could also be just a simple rule-based uh, solution. Great. Next question here is, is your work with H2O available for others? I, I guess I would say Absolutely. yeah, some yeah. of the work that you guys have done and helping us with uh, sparkling water, for example. Yeah, the, the external the cluster product. mode is just a switch that you tune up when, yeah. when you start the cluster. So Our core principle is if we pay uh, companies, it should end up in open source uh, community. So we, we do not pay for, uh, or there are very rare examples where we pay for closed stuff. So pretty much everything is, uh, and we should thank be open. you for that. Um, okay, when it comes to machine learning, how do you, oh, we already did that yeah. one, thank you. Okay, the last question, how do you make sure that feature transformations are the same in training and prediction systems? Well, what is nice about H2O is that many of them are uh, incorporated already in the, in the Mojo, mm -hmm. so that's uh, a nice thing about uh, using that. Um, yeah, there's a risk. Uh, we have uh, Perl to post-process stuff that comes out of Cassandra, uh, and that's where risks uh, occur that the, tra the transformation there is a bit different from, uh, from what people do offline. Um, and in many cases, there are not many sophisticated transformations going on, to be honest. I mean, uh, simple features really work quite well, especially if you use random forests who, who extract value automatically from it. Um, okay. so. I think we got time just for one more, so why don't you guys pick which one you want to answer there of the remaining ones. How do you make sure feature transformations are the same? Oh, we already did that one, yeah. so how about? We have a can we scale driverless <laughs> AI for bookings.com purposes? How's that? From Antonio. You want to answer the question yourself, Antonio? Or? <laughs> 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 we're, we're keeping an eye on it and, and see also the progress, right? It's also uh, a product that is evolving quite fast. Um, so when we first tried it out, there were some features that were not really, um, that there were missing there, like for example, support to, from reading from HDFS. So I couldn't really use it with our data set. Uh, but it's something that is on our radar. But how would you like your job if we have driverless AI? I can do something else. Yeah? <laughs>
<laughs> okay, well, I think that's it. Thank you, Ben, Luca. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys. And uh, it's time for lunch, so thank you.